here. Um, hello. 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 Thank you very much. That's nice. Um, welcome. I'm uh, really glad to see you all here on this uh, this nippy little night. Um, but uh, my name is Carrie Skarbica. For those of you who don't know me, I am an assistant professor of photography here at OSU. And I'm also the current chair of the Visiting Artists and Scholars Lecture Series. And um, this VAS, as we call it, if you're not familiar with the, with the term, um, it's short, uh, is a, it's really been amazingly successful um, over the years. Not just my time, I think I've done an okay job, but before it, I mean, this has always been a wonderful program. I'm really honored to be part of it. And um, over the years, we've actually brought in distinguished artists and art historians to our campus, like Bill Viola, we've had uh, Marina Bromvik, we've had Du Ho Su, Richard Mizrak, Hassan Alahi, Hank Willis Thomas, and most recently, if you might remember, uh, some of you in the audience for Farrah Karapedian's uh, wonderful talk on her photography. Um, so I would love to, I always like to begin this evening thanking uh, our, 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 our Director of uh, School of Arts and Communications, Leanne Garrison. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I, we could never do any of this without the, my colleagues, uh, my supportive colleagues and the wonderful staff that work so hard um, behind and in front of uh, the scenes here uh, to make a really successful program. Um, it's, oh, I'm just so honored to be working with you guys every single day. And also I'd like to thank you, the students in the community, uh, because of course, and I've said this before, there would be no BAS without you. So thank you once again for being part of this. So. Our artist tonight, Dred Scott, makes revolutionary art to propel history forward. On the forefront of activism and social justice and revolution for the past 30 years, he hates it when I say that, uh, he first received national attention in 1989 when, he's, when his art became the center of controversy over its use of the American flag, while he was a student at the Art Institute of Chicago. And some of you might have been in Dred's workshops that he's had today, and he's been talking about nationalism and patriotism and the conversation that we've been having. It's been really important, and we have two more workshops that are going to be happening tomorrow. So if you haven't had a chance or an opportunity to go to one, one at noon and one at two o'clock, you're welcome to ask me about details for that. Anyways, this controversy basically drew the ire of Big Daddy Bush, George H., and, uh, his, and they basically called the Dred's art disgraceful. And the entire U.S. Senate denounced this work and outlawed it when they passed legislation to protect the flag. Um, on a more personal note, I first met Dredd in 2005 when I was embroiled in my own uh, national controversy. And I have to tell you, there was something really comforting about meeting somebody who had taken the slings and arrows uh, such, with such grace and, 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 and composure. Um, you know, like it was just a walk in the park. So I've always actually been indebted to this gentleman for making me see that you can make art, you can make powerful art, and you can stand up for it, and you can still take and wake up the next day. So um, I've always been grateful to, to have this person uh, in my life. Um, now, Dredd himself is an extremely accomplished artist, and a few things I'm gonna tell you about. His work has been included in recent exhibitions at MoMA PS1, the Walker Art Center, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and the Pori Art Museum in Finland, as well as on view in America is Hard to See at the Whitney Museum of American's Art, first inaugural exhibition in their new building. In 2012, the BAM, or the Brooklyn Academy of Music, presented his performance, Dred Scott Decision, as part of their 30th anniversary Next Wave Festival. Uh, Jack Shaman, a prestigious gallery in New York City, as well as Winkleman Gallery in New York City, have both recently exhibited his work, and his public sculptures have been installed in Logan Square in Philadelphia and the Fransonia, I believe that's uh, Franconia, Fransonia? Franconia. Franconia, excuse me, uh, Sculpture Park in Minnesota. His work is in the collection of the Whitney Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Akron Museum of Art. His work has been written about, actually, he has been written about in the New York Times, Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, Art News, Art 21 Magazine, Time, The London Guardian, and you might have actually caught his amazing uh, cover of Art Forum Magazine that came out, uh, I think it was last year? That's November. November, exactly. Um, he has also appeared on numerous uh, local and national television radio shows, including Oprah, The Today Show, and CBS This Morning, speaking about his work and the controversy surrounding it. Dredd is a recipient of the grants from the Creative Capital Foundation, the MAP Fund, the Open Institute, and a Blade of Grass Foundation. And last month, he was awarded the very prestigious United States Artist Fellowship. 
I cannot tell you how pleased it is that I am to bring this band to stage. It is to my distinct honor and pleasure to present the artist and revolutionary Dred Scott. So thank you, Carrie, for that introduction. Um, that guy sounds kind of interesting. Hopefully I will live up to that. <laughs> Um, and thank you guys for coming out, and thank you to OSU for having me in the, the School of Art. Um, you know, and uh, so I'm just gonna get on with it. I'm initially gonna talk to you for a, you know a couple minutes to give you some context to what I do, and then mostly I'm gonna show some pictures and videos, and uh, then we can have a conversation. Um, and so, you know, Carrie said that I make revolutionary art to propel history forward, and that's true. That's a sort of like tagline almost. And, you know, I work in a lot of different media. I mean, some of it's video, some of it's performance, some of it's installation, some of it's photography, some of it's printmaking, a tiny bit of it's painting. And so, you know, part of the question is, what makes a Dred Scott work? A Dred Scott work if I'm working in all these different media. Um, well, you know, when I say make revolutionary art to propel history forward, that's actually what kind of coheres it. And I'm really trying to have an audience confront a lot of the the underlying values and ideals of American society. And, and, and generally, I'm also trying to help an audience to imagine how the world could be radically different and far better. Um, and as part of all that process, I'm, I often say I like to illuminate this era. But then the question is, what is this era? So I've got some questions for you. Do you all bring your blue books or anything? To, no. OK, they're just yes, no questions. We're not going for consensus. You just got to shout out the answer, yes, no, you know. And so the first question is like a real easy one. Do you have hope for the future? Yes. 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 Okay. Next question. Do you think the U.S. government tortures people? Yes. All right. We got tortured then. That's great. Um, do you think that basic rights in this country are being eroded? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you think that uh, having one in nine young black men in prison is acceptable? No. Do you think a society where one in five women will be battered during her lifetime is a model society to uphold? No. Does it make you feel comfortable that the United States government is spying on all emails, websites, and phone calls that everybody on the planet is making? No. Do you think that leaders in this country or any other country are doing what's necessary to stop global climate change? No. Um, yeah. do, you think that, do you think that American lives are more important than other people's lives? No. Um, do you think that the government lies to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. We're pretty emphatic on that one, too. <laughs> Hell yes. Okay. Um, do you think a society where the police uh, murder unarmed youth and have those murders captured on video and then work to cover up those murders have any legitimacy whatsoever? No. Do you think that a society that knowingly poisons the drinking water of its citizens has any legitimacy whatsoever? No. Okay. Um, do you think that the government values your life? No. Okay. So several of you said that you had hope for the future. <laughs> the present isn't looking so good. Um, and so w what's that hope based on? Um, well, we we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, and, and um, you know, so this is, you know, I have hope for the future too. Um, but that hope is actually based on hoping that people and helping people confront the reality of the present. I think we live in a polarized world, a very polarized world, and I don't mean Democrats over here, Republicans over there. That's not what I'm talking about. I think it's a polarized world where a very small handful of people control the great wealth and knowledge that humanity as a whole has created. Um, but it actually doesn't have to be that way. We can get to a radically different world, um, and people can make a completely different world without classes and without exploitation. And as part of making that world, people can transform themselves in the process. But to do that, we need revolution. And my work is actually about helping people bring this new world into being. And so that's the, the introduction. Um, I mean, some, in some of the points in this talk, I'm going to show some work that's not mine. And so I'm going to start there. And if we can get the lights down, then maybe, maybe have them on me. But I mostly want people to see that now. All right, excellent. And so, um, you know, this is not a campaign rally. This is a rally that is um, taking place when the President of the United States, the current one, um, is, you know, speaking to people he views as his fan base. And I think, you know, the backdrop of why I'm showing that is this. 
Um, this is an image of the Nuremberg rallies, one of the Nuremberg rallies. The Nuremberg rallies happened in the south of uh, Germany in the, the mid-30s to early 40s, and that was the base of the, the Nazi party. And they would, you know, get together and rally, you know, thousands and thousands of people and, and over the course of a weekend and both prepare for war but also sort of prepare their ideology. And so I want to make sure that the, the first image I show you doesn't become the second. And that's sort of the backdrop which we're all kind of living in right now and, and for helping to understand some of how I'm thinking about my work now, although the overwhelming majority of the work that I'm going to show you was made, you know, before this. Uh, not not before this, but before the, before the first one. I, was, I wasn't born before this. I'm old, you know, but not that old. So, um, this is a project that, I'm not going to talk about this project so much, but it's an introduction to the, the project that I do want to talk about. So I was an undergraduate art student. In 1987, I started making these installations for audience participation. And I started doing it because I was, you know, a young art student, and I was trying to make work that talked about the world that we lived in, and I really wanted to make work that you know people would you know broadly define as its political art, and that's a questionable term, but leaving that aside, I wanted to make work that talked to the big questions of the day. But I realized that a lot of artists who were doing that or trying to do that, if you walked into the gallery and you kind of agreed with the perspective of the artist, you stayed and looked at it, and if you didn't agree with the perspective of the artist, you'd walk out. And so I wanted to make work that the audience was kind of implicated in and involved in as soon as they saw the work. And so I did these installations for audience participation. So in this case, you can see that you know there's a person sort of writing in a book. And so the way these were set up was there'd be some sort of photo montage that would be you know in, in charged images of the time. They would have some sort of text on the photo montage, and then there was text here on the wall, text here, a book that people could write responses to the whatever question was, and then a reproduction of the, the work. And so. In this case, the, you know, this is a piece that says, we serve and protect. I don't remember the exact text for this, but in some of the, the political statements that would be on the wall here might be, um, if you believe that the United States of America should be overthrown through armed revolution and are currently participating in activity to do so, please feel free to take a print. And then there was a reproduction of, of that work right here, you could see. And, and then it said, if you take a print, uh, please explain why in the book below. And so it was a dialogue with people that are, you know, coming to the gallery, and it's their views in the book that people are also seeing as part of the work. And beyond just wanting to give people some art for their participation, the 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 quote, the political question was reproduced on the the artwork. So it said, the person who owns this print believes that the United States of America should be overthrown through armed revolution and is currently participating in activity to do so. It is because of this that they were given this print. And so I was really trying to extend the dialogue outside of the art world and into people's living rooms. And so here you see a person taking this print and they you know, would put it up in their room. And so it was kind of like, you know, there was no sort of guard standing over them and said, well, let's really see, do you, are you really participating in armed activity to overthrow the United States of America? No, it could just be like, man, I really like that print. I'm not so sure about the statement, but I really like this print, so I'll stick it up on my wall and you'll have some interesting conversations. So as you can see in this work, um, you know, there's an American flag and there's a K missing from this. This is actually a, a white supremacist rally in Chicago that happened in 1985. Um, and just an aside on that, and people seeing this work wouldn't know this, but it's actually at a LGBT uh, 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 gay pride day, actually. And one thing these white supremacists didn't count on was angry queens. <laughs> <laughs> they, they left with their tails between their legs. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, this truckload of Nazis um, got chased out of town. Um, so, so anyway, um, this work was, you know, this, this dialogue, and it started a lot of the different images. You know, I, I showed that there were four images that I first showed, the four installations. There were about 11 of them in the body of work, and a lot of them I kept using the American flag, and I was working fairly intuitively at the time. That's how a lot of artists are trained to work. You just make it, and then you think about it later. That's not so much how I work now, but many artists do work that way, and that's how I was trained, and I kept seeing this, the American flag. I kept using this as a symbol. And at the time, you know, George Bush won, George Herbert Walker Bush, was campaigning for president. And he kept appearing in flag factories and saying that, look, we really need to bring back the American flag. Now this was on the, the sort of in the wake of the upheaval, the social upheaval that was the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the anti-war movement in Viet against Vietnam, 
the women's liberation movement, the, the gay liberation movement. So there's all this social upheaval, but particularly like the Vietnam syndrome, and the US lost that war. And the, the people who run this country were kind of smarting from that. And so George Bush comes along and said, look, we really need the flag. And one of the things he said is, well, in other countries, they have a king or a queen to unite people. And in America, we don't have that. What we have is the American flag. And so I'm like, ah, this is interesting. This is a big question in society. I should make some work about that. So I make this work called, What is the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag? Which, like the other work, um, you know, it is an installation for audience participation. There's, whoop, there's a photo montage up here. And just for now, know that it has text that says, what's the proper way to display a U.S. flag? There was no other text that was any political question. It was just like, what's the proper way to display a US flag? There were books that you could write responses to, and there was a three by five foot flag that you had the option of standing on as you wrote your responses. Um, the text, as you can see, I mean, the, the photo montage has the text, what's the proper way to display a US flag? And then it has South Korean students burning US flags, holding a sign that says, Yankee go home, son of a bitch. <laughs> and below that were Yankees coming home from in, a, in coffins and a troop transport coming back from Vietnam. And you know, this was an installation for audience participation. People could participate. You could write responses however you wanted. One of the ways you could stand on the flag, and the other way was standing next to it. Um, and so again, people responded in lots of different ways. And so people sometimes wrote really long contemplative things. Some other things were shorter. Um, sometimes they you know, wrote really short stuff. On a pole! Um, you had drawings that, that were the, Sometimes you had longer drawings. Um, larger drawings. Um, this, this was first shown uh, at a, a small gallery in Chicago, and the second time it was shown it was a, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was an undergraduate student at the time. And you know, students are clever, and so somebody left me a film strip that I could, you know, possibly look at at some point. Um, there were, you know, text in. This is, uh, I think it's in Farsi, maybe Arabic. I don't remember. But there were, you know, people wrote in about nine different languages from twelve different countries. Um, what their thoughts were. So again, not just about my thoughts, but here's what some other people said. I'm a German girl. If we Germans would admire our flag as you all do, we would be called Nazis again. I think you do have too much trouble about this flag. You're fucked. Minorities get everything. In Russia, you would be shot and your family would have to pay for the bullets. But once again, what do you expect from a nigger named Dred Scott? Dear Dred, like someone who viewed the exhibit, I began reading other people's comments standing next to the flag, but gradually moved to standing on it. As someone raised to be iconoclastic, at least I thought I was, it was an interesting moment of self-awareness, which I think is the whole purpose of this display. Perhaps when human life and liberty is really valued above property and symbols in America, we will all have more allegiance to the principles of liberty and justice for all. As a veteran defending the flag, I personally would never defend your stupid ass. You should be shot. U.S. Navy SEAL team. <laughs> the flag I'm standing on stands for everything oppressive in this system. The murder of the Indians and all the oppressed around the world, including my brother, who was shot by a pig who kicked over his body to, quote, make sure the nigger was dead, unquote. The pig was wearing the flag. Thank you, Dred Scott, for this opportunity. So, you know, there was a range of views about this, about the flag, about U.S. patriotism, and about me. Um, and, and so it wasn't just like, hey, everybody loved the work or everybody hated the work. It was kind of a bell curve. There were sort of extremes on both ends, and then there was stuff in the middle. And, and you know, some of the stuff I might agree with, some of it you might agree with. But it's, again, all these people were really talking very vigorously and, and, and um, you know, in very visceral ways about how they understood this question. And some, some not very heartfelt ways. So it got to be a little bit controversial. This is a demonstration in front of the, the Art Institute of Chicago, which is physically and in many ways, including financial, attached to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is where the work was on display at that time. And this is a demonstration of 2,500 um, reactionary veterans, almost all of them white, almost all of them from World War II and the Korean War. The Vietnam vets actually kind of, a lot of them liked what I was doing. But these guys really didn't, didn't, and they chanted things like, the flag and the artist hang them both high, bringing back images of lynching. Do we have any art students in the audience? 
Yeah, okay, you got some more. So they held signs, and one of them said, the proper way to show respect to an art student. So just in case anybody ever does this to you, if you're an art student, this is only for the art students in the audience, because other people might be insulted by this, but if you're an art student and somebody does this, they are showing you the proper respect. It's a friendly gesture. <laughs> Just know this. I'm, I'm trying to clear. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. I'm trying to clarify some things for you guys. Um, they also had a sign that said, "Go try it their chunk," and they had like a caricature of me standing on the flag and a caricature of some some soldiers with guns, sort of threatening him. And so, you know, I mean, it's a demonstration. People have to have signs. But I was actually really intrigued by this because the the argument, the logic is, if I were to stand on the flag of some other country, there, wherever there is, perhaps Russia, because you know, I mean, somebody had said, you know, if I tried this in Russia, I'd be shot. Um, so maybe if I went to Russia and stood on their flag, I would be threatened by soldiers who would try and kill me or something like that. So the thing is, either these guys like really, really, really understood irony or had no clue. And I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, you know, people are saying my work should be pulled off the walls and destroyed and stuff like that. So I gave a press conference about, you know, my, trying to get my views of it out there. And I'm compressing a lot of history here, but it did get to the point where George Herbert Walker Bush called my work disgraceful. So I'm a 24-year-old art student at a Midwestern art school, and I'm like, what? The President of the United States knows I exist? <laughs> and he doesn't like what I'm doing? Oh, this is a great job. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> So then it got to the point where the Senate decided to start talking about this work. Then votes to, to ban uh, flag display on floor or ground. The Senate on Thursday voted 97 to 0 to outlaw displaying the flag of the United States on the floor or ground and denounced a flag exhibit on the floor of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I don't know much about art, <laughs> but I know desecration when I see it. So Minority Leader Robert J. Dole, Republican of Kansas, in introducing the measure, this disgraceful display needs much more than symbolic action. So, again, 24 years old, student at a Midwestern art school, and previously pretty unknown. Um, and so the Senate is going to the extraordinary measure of outlawing my art. And so I was smart enough at the time to know that this is kind of unusual and that I wouldn't expect this to happen again, but this really taught me something. Both their response and the fact that people were standing in line literally an hour to see, to see a student exhibition, and then would call up on talk radio show, and some of these people would come from the housing project, to see a contemporary artwork, a conceptual installation for audience participation, and then not only give political support and feedback, but actually give art criticism. So this really taught me something about the power of art. Again, this was unlikely to happen repeat itself the same way. I didn't think my work was going to be talked about and denounced by presidents again, although, you know, you never know. New president on the throne, you know, <laughs> see if I can go two for two. Um, <laughs> but it, this really did sort of set my life on kind of a course, because I, I understood that if the people who have the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, cops, 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 and more cops, news media and the ability to talk on news media it could be so threatened that somebody might see this artwork that they go to the extraordinary measure of outlawing it, that this was powerful. That somebody might look at that and say, well, hey, why are we worshiping this flag? Who died and left you in charge? If this country was so powerful, they wouldn't be so threatened by, again, an art student that was 24 years old at a student display. If this work actually mattered and was resonant for lots of people and could change people's thinking and help them think in ways that they might not otherwise think or explore ideas they might not otherwise explore, that was powerful. And so it sort of set me on a mission. But I did have a problem. My work was outlawed. So what should one do when one is, con you know, is confronted with unjust laws? You defy that law. Um, so this is me burning flags on the steps of the Capitol. Um, <laughs> And I'm compressing a lot of complicated history into something that is bite-sized and manageable here. Um, but it was not just about me. There were other people who burned flags on the steps of the Capitol. There was a guy named Joey Johnson who was a defendant in a previous flag burning case that had just come down for the Supreme Court um, that the Senate sort of voted to overturn that law. There was a revolutionary artist named Sean Eichmann and um, a, a really cool veteran named Dave Blaylock, a Vietnam vet. 
And so, you know, we define this law again, not just about my art. It really, this law was not just about my art. And if I'm giving that impression, that's not true, but it was about bigger things that my art touched on. But it, my art was, you know, maybe illegal. So I burned flags on the steps of the Capitol and it became a Supreme Court case. Um, this is United States of America versus Sean Eichmann et al. I'm part of et al. and very proudly to be part of et al. And so, um, because of that case, you guys can do whatever you want with the flag. You can put it on a pole. You could make art about it. You could wear a little, little flag lapel pin. You could blow your nose in it. You could walk on it. Um, but you know, it's uh, because of actually having to you know, make these ideas and fight the political battle that people now have the the, the legal right to do whatever you want. That said, um, if you burn a flag, it's entirely possible that um, members of the police department might say, "Oh, well, we got to stop you from." No, we can't. We can't. We can't stop you from burning the flag. Well, you have an open flame in public, or you're inciting riot, or something like that. So, it's still a, a very bold political act, but it is one that is, you know, protected. And if you happen to want to spend some time in court and have good lawyers, you'll be able to get away with it. Um, <laughs> but as long as we're in the burning phase of the show, um, burning the U.S. Constitution. Um, so this is a triptych that is a, a three. There are three images in this. Um, in, in 2011, I was studying Ai Weiwei. Um, Ai Weiwei is a great dissident radical Chinese artist. And um, this is a piece that he did called Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn. And so, you know, he's standing there holding a Han Dynasty Urn. And then through the power and magic of photography, a Han Dynasty Urn is suspended in midair. And then you see a Han Dynasty Urn smashed on the ground. And so one of the things that he said was, well, you know, we actually, if you want to make something new in culture, you have to be willing to change or perhaps even destroy the old. And I thought that was actually really insightful. And part of what he was getting at is that in China, one of the ways that people are trained to make art is that you study really, really hard and, and, and study the old masters. And if you work really, really hard and are really, really good and really, really lucky, you might make something that's almost as good as, uh, as a master made 500 years ago. And Weiwei was saying that's kind of a real constraint on freedom and a constraint on making something new. And that's why I thought it was really insightful. And I thought, well, what's a constraint on freedom in America? And you know, I thought, well, you know, there's no 200 years of history of ceramics or anything like that because the country's you know just about 240 years old. So that's not the constraint. But what is a constraint? Well, the U.S. Constitution. You know, everybody talks about the U.S. Constitution bringing freedom. And you know, I've even heard that today when we were talking a little bit about um, you know patriotism and some of the workshops, and we'll talk more about that. But you know, this document, you know, begins "We the People," um, is actually pretty boring. How many people here have read the U.S. Constitution? So you know, maybe about half of you. The other half of you, you got some homework to do. And um, you know, I, uh, in assigning this, I'm not assigning you hundreds of pages of reading. It's a pretty short document. You can. Get it online at the Library of Congress. Might be in a dictionary you have if you still have one of those things. And it's, you know, really like about five pages long. It's not really long. It's also a pretty boring document. I mean, it largely is saying, well, you got to be 35 to be president. There's going to be executive, legislative, and, and judicial branches of government. This is how old you got to be to be a senator. These are some of the rights that are going to be held for for the federal government. These are some rights that are going to be state rights, government, you know, and things like that. Pretty boring. Not actually a whole lot about freedom in there. But so why do we think that? Well, then, you know, there is this section of the Bill of Rights, which actually talks about, well, you have the freedom of speech, you have the right to bear arms, et cetera, et cetera. But that's kind of like a bit of an afterthought in some ways. I mean, quite literally, and then there are amendments after that. But, but um, so there's not a whole lot about freedom. It's largely just a boring administrative document. Um, and, you know, you get right in, and you realize, well, you know, really a lot of what this is talking about is the, the right to own property and a particular type of property. So one of the things is that this is a document that was written by slave owners and friends of slave owners to define the legal and political structure of a society whose economy is rooted in slavery. Okay? Um, who here is sort of three-fifths of a man? Okay, more than half. This is good. Okay, so you guys have read that part of the Constitution, but not the whole thing. Well, it's good that you read that part. So what's special about that part? Well, basically, it's actually giving disproportionate federal representation to states that have a lot of enslaved people. So that's sort of saying, well, we got this institution of slavery. And the people who really benefit most from slavery, the South, 
are going to have much more federal representation to talk about what form of federal government is and how to, to run the government, administer laws, and pass laws, including around slavery, um, than the North. There were people in the North that had a lot of property, but their property wasn't human beings. And so really, this is a document whose really foundational thing is to, to enshrine slavery and the rights of slave owners. So three-fifths of the men, you guys, those of you who know that and have read the Constitution, where, is, where does it talk about that? I mean, is it like near the back? Is it a footnote? Is it up front? Where, where is this? Okay, fourth paragraph, Article 1. This is not something that's buried. This is something that's very central to understanding U.S. law, policy, custom, and out, outlook. So this is a document, again, written by slave owners and friends of slave owners to define the legal and political framework for a society that was sort of, whose economy was rooted in slavery. And so you have we the people, we the people in flames, we the people in ashes. I think that most of us, in fact, even a lot of people who I bitterly disagree with, would not think that slavery is an important institution to uphold and enshrine in law as something that, and, and give people a lot more voting power federally because they enslave people. You know, um, So if we were writing the, the laws of today, we wouldn't write that document. So all this talk about freedom, I, I, it's a, sort of, I challenge you, and what the work is about is actually challenging people to get beyond this. This is a, thinking about the Constitution, we need more democracy, we gotta go back to the founding fathers, we need to, whatever, is actually going back to a document that doesn't really reflect our views or our understanding of modern society, or at least I hope that they don't. Um, playing a slow moving video and it's not right now so hold on I'm going to take a little bit of time trying to get it to play. No it doesn't need Wi-Fi it's, it's hosted locally and it ran oh it's going now. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands in, in, indivisible down on this a bit, but if the sound guy's here and can, if he can crank up the volume a little bit, it doesn't matter for this video so much, but for next, the next video, I'm going to want more volume. So anyway, this is a, a video that has some pretty horrible things be, being said by some young people. Um, it also has some horrible quotes, too, not just the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, <laughs> um, so it was a a piece that is a collaborative piece that I did with the artist Jenny Polak. Um, and she and I were living in, in New York at, you know, during 9-11 and we saw people kind of, we knew that people like just disappeared off the streets and, and there were people in, in some of the delis and bodegas that, that, you know, worked there that just sort of disappeared. And a lot of Jenny's work deals with immigration politics and so we were paying fairly close attention to some of this. And we wanted to make work that talked about it. And um, one of the things is that you know we we knew that that sort of racism and nationalism and xenophobia aren't something that people are born knowing. It's something that that sort of they're trained in. 
and we wanted to look at how young people started to think like their parents. And here was a, an example of that was starting to happen. We knew that there were, you know, little kids that were saying horrific things that they didn't think of themselves, but they would have, you know, heard their parents say. Um, and we also knew that, you know, there's this indoctrination around the Pledge of Allegiance that people start saying that even before they know much about what the word allegiance is, let alone thoughts about what the political structure that's represented by a flag is. But they're, you know, trained, you gotta say this mantra over and over again. And so we wanted to sort of talk about that. The images, the way they're, the reason they're all grainy um, is because they're taken from Department of Justice footage. And all these people that were disappeared after 9-11, some of them ended up in the um, um, Manhattan Detention Facility. And they eventually talked to their lawyers and they said, hey, you know, we were brutalized and tortured in prison. And the lawyer said, well, you know, that, that may be true, but there's you know, nothing we can do about it. And then the lawyers started to talk to each other. And they realized that there was a haunting similarity between some of the stories, including that many of the men said, we had our faces slammed into a wall that had an, a, a flag, an American flag on it. And the, the lawyers were like, huh. When the lawyers started, uh, that, the people are not making that up. That's very specific. Let's ask the Department of Justice if there's any evidence of this. And the DOJ said, well, yeah, there might be some. And it's like, you know, well, could you show us? Well, there's videotape. Lawyers were like, okay, can we see these videos? And the DOJ was, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we can give it to you. Oh, actually, you know what? Second thought, we, we lost it. <laughs> um, and so they did make these videos because they thought, we're doing stuff by the book. We're doing stuff by the, by the law. And but they did eventually have to produce a transcript of the tape and, and some still images, which then was handed over to the lawyers and which Jenny and I used. So the images are images from that video that, that was showed some you know, Arab and Muslim men being brutalized. And the words that, that the young man is saying are words that were screamed at these people as they were being brutalized. You know, the fucking Muslim, don't expect to go home or ever see your family again, you're praying bullshit, all of that. So that was what, you know, was being said, and we really wanted to make work that enabled people who perhaps had citizenship and, and papers and wasn't, weren't going to have that happen to them, but all this stuff was being done in their name.
not a photograph of mine. This is a photograph of civil rights demonstrators in Birmingham, Alabama having fire hoses turned on them. And we've all seen th this image perhaps exactly or Im images like it. And a lot of times when we look at it, it's used as an example to say, see, this is how bad the civil rights, I mean, how bad civil rights were in this country and how oppressive this country was towards black people, particularly in the South. And it's true, being hit by a fire hose is pretty oppressive and it's something that people should kind of avoid doing. But the more I looked at these images, the more I actually saw another story that was often not thought about or discussed so much. And that is that these people, the people in the photographs, were actually doing a tremendous amount of resistance and defying sort of a century or more of oppression. Um, they, you know, a lot of times we talk about Jim Crow and these guys were trying to break the back of Jim Crow. And we talk about Jim Crow as being, oh, well, you know, black people couldn't sit down at a lunch counter, um, you know, with, with a, and get served, or they had to go in the back door, or they had to step off the sidewalk um, when a white, white you know, man or, per, or person approached. And that's true. And that daily indignation and humiliation was something that should have been fought against. But the thing that reinforced and backed all that up was lynching. It isn't talked about so much that you know why black people said, well, all right, I, you know, I'm not, I'm just not going to go to that swimming pool, or I'm not going to, you know, ex I'm going to accept not being served at a restaurant, it was because they could be lynched, and just as a, a, you know, this was not something that was particularly rare, and I have, you know, personal family history with it. My grandfather lived in a town, grew up in a town called Edwards, Mississippi, which is probably about the size of this room. Um, and you know, when he was young and wanting to get out of that small town, and he, he knew that soon he was going to be going to Howard University, and he wanted to look good. So he goes down to the, the local haberdashery and tries on a hat, and he decides he doesn't like it. And, and he says, look, I don't want this hat. And the owner of the store goes, Sydney, wh what do you mean you don't want this hat? He's like, I don't like it. I don't want this hat. It's like, no, Sydney, that's your hat. You, you can't try on a hat. And it's like, I don't like it. I don't want this hat. Well, my grandfather had to leave town the next night, um, or that night, really, because for fear he could be lynched. Why? Because it would be a tremendous indignity for a hat that had been soiled by touching the head of a black man to, to reach the head of a white man. And so this was, you know, just, it was pervasive all through the South, and we'll talk more about lynching in a bit, but I really want to focus on resistance, because a lot of times when people make work that talks about some of the big questions confronting humanity, we're focusing on a lot of the... The, the horror and shortcomings of a particular society. And a lot of my work and a lot of good work does that. But I really wanted to talk about people fighting against, you know, resisting. I've been thinking a lot about that recently. And so I did a performance called On the Impossibility of Freedom in a Country Founded on Slavery and Genocide, where I walked into the battering water jet from a fire hose. I hired some firemen and had them turn a fire hose on me. It's a durational performance for as long as I could. Um, and it was done in November of, sorry, October of uh, 2014. And the performance had been planned, for, we were working on it for several months to get the permits and things necessary. It was a live performance and it was seen by about 500 people. Um, and about half of those 500 were kids from a school in a neighborhood called Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyvesant, which is a historically black, historically poor neighborhood in, in New York. And each of them knew that they could be the next Mike Brown. We'd all heard the words Mike, name Mike Brown for the first time in August of, of uh, 2014. And so people were going around being like, hands up, don't shoot, which was actually an important act of resistance. But all these kids knew that for, for any reason or no reason whatsoever, they could be killed. Um, and, but they didn't necessarily know how they could be the next Freedom Riders. 
And so the part of the performance was actually really looking at performing in a way that people could imagine themselves, and try, I was trying to embody that, that resistance, and they could imagine themselves being those people that were changing the world. So this is, again, not my work. Um, uh, this is a, a documentation of a flag, a banner that the NAACP used to hang outside of their headquarters in New York the day after anybody was lynched. And they were doing it as part of an anti-lynching campaign. The fact that there even needed to be an anti-lynching campaign tells you something. Um, but there were basically about 4,600 lynchings between 1865 and 1965. At the height of lynching, there were, were about 1,700 people lynched in a decade from 1895, 18, 1885 to 1894. Um, and so this was not just a few good old boys you know, issuing some rough justice. This was something that was fairly common. And you know, often it was advertised. Lynchings were not just a couple people. Sometimes there were as many as 10,000 people who would come from a surrounding town to see somebody lynched. As I said, it you know it affected my family. It affected all families, and much, you know, almost all black people knew that. Though you know, most black people clearly weren't lynched, but everybody lived with the knowledge that, for you know, not stepping off the sidewalk when a white person passed, joining a union, owning property, going in a store and having a white woman accuse you of doing a wolf whistle at her, which was what Emmett Till was lynched for in 1955, and recently, about a year ago, the person who you know, told the story that you know he whistled at me. Um, she said, well, no, that didn't really happen. So Emmett Till was killed for no reason at all. All black people in the North and in the South knew that those are the kind of things that could happen to you in America. And so, you know, but this is something we think of as a scourge from the past. So why am I talking about lynching? Clearly that, you know, people aren't set on fire now or hung from trees now, by and large. That's true. Um, but I do think that that same terror that affected all black people exists now, but in different form. So I updated this work. And so, you know, some people say, well, look, why did you do that? And I say, well, a lot of my work looks at how the past sort of both sets the stage for the present, but exists in the present in new form. It's true that black people aren't hung from trees anymore by and large. Lynchings, traditional lynching still happens, but it's pretty rare. Um, but almost all black families have a talk with their children when they turn 12 or 13 or 14 about how to survive an encounter with the police. And we all know that telling your children to you know, be respectful or put your hands up or put your hands down or don't run or run, all of those things will actually not protect them. Black people have been shot for running. They've, you know, Walter Scott was shot. I talk about Walter Scott. He was shot in South Carolina. And I made this piece in response to his murder because he was seen, the cop was seen on film. Walter Scott was stopped by a traffic light. And he did what apparently was the reasonable thing to do and fled for his life. The policeman shot him at about 30 yards when Walter was running. Walter was about 50 years old. No threat to anybody, no threat to the cop. And the cop just cold blooded and killed him. People have been shot for standing still. Uh, Tamir Rice was shot two seconds after the police showed up for just sitting down in a gazebo with no other people around um, with a toy gun. John Crawford was shot in a Walmart holding a gun that they sold in Walmart, not threatening anybody, but the police show up and within seconds he's dead. Um, uh, um, Freddie Gray had his back broken by being hogtied and driven around the back of a police car or police van. Um, people have been choked to death for selling Lucy cigarettes, supposedly. This is a terror that affects all black people. So I said that there were, were 1,700 people lynched in a decade um, at the height of lynching. So it's actually 1,726. The police killed about 1,100 people last year. So about five times the rate. Now, all those people aren't black. In fact, most people that the police kill are white. Um, but a disproportionate number are black. You're, you're about seven times more likely to be killed by the police if you're black than if you're white. And so I thought it was unfortunately necessary to make this update to this sign. Got on front page of NewYorkTimes.com, which was, I was happy about. So my work shows in lots of different contexts. It's in galleries. It's outside of galleries. It's on the streets. It gets back into museums. The piece currently is actually on view at, the, at uh, uh, the Whitney Museum, which is really great. There's a really cool show 
called a, uh, a, An Incomplete History of Protest, uh, 1940 to uh, 2017 work from the Whitney Collection, which is really great. So you come off the elevators on the sixth floor and you see this work and it's fantastic. So I've been thinking a lot about resistance, and other artists have thought about resistance, and particularly resistance to enslavement. This is a work by um, uh, Hale Woodruff, which is a depiction of the Amistad uprising. The Amistad was a slave ship that um, was taking people um, to, to basically part of the Caribbean to be enslaved. There was a mutiny. Um, the slaves actually took over the ship, a complicated story. They end, many of them ended up getting back to Africa. And there's a kind of decent Spielberg movie made about it called Amistad. Um, but the, this painting actually is depicting these slave rebels as heroes, which I think is really important. Other artists have looked at uh, uprisings as, as heroic. This is a Kata Kolwitz, a great German artist, um, showing peasant uprisings from the, actually from the 1600s, even though she was doing this in the early 1900s. And this is a uh, Jacob Lawrence uh, depicting uh, uh, Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and so a lot of artists have been thinking about slavery and resistance and leaders of re uh, resistance. And so I got invited to do a residency at the McCall Center, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, to, to do a residency. And, and I'm an artist, and I'm always thinking about art ideas. And, and I had an idea, like, eh, you know, they just put on the, the, the shelf. And when they said, look, we invite you to this residency, but it's a project-based residency, um, they said, what do you want to do? And I took out this idea that I had a couple of years before. I said, you know, I'd like to see a slave rebellion reenactment. I'm thinking, they're not going to say yes to this, but that's what I want to do. And so I told them, and they said yes. And I said, well, you know, I'm probably not going to do this in Charlotte or even during the residency. They said, no, we're OK with that. We want to support you doing this. And I said, all right, I will come down. So I came down. and. Um, the day I get there, I, you know, my studio is across the street over here, and I see this sign. And this sign says, you know, Confederate Cabinet with President Davis held last full meeting in April 22nd, 28th, 1865, in a house which was located here. And so, you know, I, as you can see, I'm concerned with history, and, and I think that history should be marked. But I'm pretty positive that I couldn't go and find any place in Berlin and say, you know, last full meeting that Chancellor Hitler had. With, with the Third Reich. This is talking about President Davis. Last time I heard, the Confederacy was a hostile country that was fighting against the United States of America. Um, but this sign, which was erected in 1977, not 1927, 1977, actually upholds the, the, the history of President Davis. So I'm thinking what, what rebellion I'm going to reenact. I'm probably going to think, maybe I'll do Nat Turner, or maybe I'll do some you know, amalgam of, of um, you know, rebellions. And then I discovered this book, On to New Orleans, which it actually tells a, about a slave revolt that happened in 1811, which happens to be the largest revolt of enslaved people in North American history. And I didn't know anything about this. I'm like, huh, why don't I know anything about this? I actually know a fair amount about American history, and specifically history of slavery. I don't know anything about this, so I need to know more. And the more I dug into it, I knew why I didn't know anything about it. But it was this large rebellion of people with a bold vision, the most radical vision of freedom and emancipation on the North American continent at the time then had a chance of success. And success would have been not just getting some revenge and killing white people before they get killed, or even escaping either individually or collectively and perhaps setting up a maroon colony. Success would have been seizing all of Orleans territory, which is modern day New Orleans, and ending slavery. It was a very bold vision, far more radical than, say, the US Constitution, which had slavery at its core, or French colonial society, which is what New Orleans was really part of. So I said, that's what I want to reenact. And so, you know, this is a lot of times what people think about you know, when we think about slavery. This is actually where sort of, um, sort of this rebellion sort of started in 1811. And, so, and you know, major 1811 slave uprising organized here. And, you know, there's this marker by the side of the road. When you're driving at 40 miles an hour. You're never going to see that. But okay, at least it's marked. So I want to have a reenactment with 500 armed black people um, with machetes and muskets and sickles and sabers and cane knives and horses and flags flying saying, on to New Orleans, freedom or death, we're going to end slavery. We're going to march from uh, Laplace, which is where that sign was, down to near Kenner. Um, Kenner is where the airport is, if any of you have visited New Orleans. Um, and it's going to be really an amazing spectacle. We're going to, this is, this is Laplace. Um, we're going to march past that. We're also, this is also Laplace. Um, this is actually a multinational trailer park. There are black people and white people, and I'm sure there's a 
a lot of really interesting conversations that aren't had there. Um, there's failed mom and pop businesses, there's churches, there's successful mom and pop businesses, there's sort of agricultural land that's kept um, not developed because they want to basically be able to flood it if the Mississippi's getting too high so that way New Orleans doesn't flood. There's heavy industry, there's uh, you know oil plants, oil refineries, and, and gypsum production plants. And so this is, I want to have this slave army match march past this. You guys have heard of American Gothic. Well, this is Afro-American Gothic. Um, and now, if you were organizing a slave revolt in 1811, you probably couldn't just put up a sign at the town square and say, hey, anybody who wants to revolt, come meet here, we'll talk about it. It would not be the best plan. You also couldn't hit up your friends on Facebook or Twitter and say, yo, whoever, you know, whoever likes this, you know, that'll be good. So slave revolts had to be organized clandestinely. And so mirroring that structure where in 1811 a man named Charles DeLons met with several individuals in one-on-one -on -one conversations on different plantations and then sort of recruited them into the slave army and then encouraged them to recruit other people. And so mirroring that structure is how the slave rebellion reenactment is going to be built. So the, the spectacle of 500 people is going to be epic and awesome, but the stuff that isn't seen is also an important part of the project. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about how people are thinking about that. Yeah, they're recruiting others into it. Why would you, you know, a 21st century guy, want to go walk 26 miles in some French colonial clothing? Because this crazy guy named Dress asked me to do it. <laughs> the idea of people coming together to pool their energy in that way, I feel like we really need that. This is the closest that I'll ever be able to come to experiencing what my ancestors experienced. I'm surrounded by comfort. So what happens if I eliminate all that and just the only connection that I have is with the people and the purpose. It's important for this generation to know that you're not the descendants of slaves, you're the descendants of people that were enslaved, and you're at your current position because of the resistance. To know that your ancestors fought is enough to build up a sense of dignity for a child. So like, if people do know about this history, I think it'll spark rebellion in people today. People are reevaluating the position of black people in American society in a way that they haven't for about 40 years. And it's not just for black people. This is a question of people who wish to be free from this oppressive society. Well, I think just in white supremacist culture, there's this idea of disconnecting like myself from the people that came before me that I'm related to. I have to own that narrative. I have to be honest with that, how that's influenced me, what's that granted. I don't think it's a reenactment. I think this is um, learning about the material, social, spiritual costs, but also the practice of insurrection. So I'm meeting with students at Black Student Unions in, in uh, New Orleans. This is students from the BSU at Tulane. I'm also meeting with students at uh, historically black colleges like Xavier University and Dillard University, as well as activists that are part of the Take Em Down New Orleans uh, movement that was part of taking down the monuments, um, the Confederate monuments, and working to build an army of the enslaved. That's going on sort of as we speak. And in fact, when I leave uh, here late tomorrow night, um, I'm going to head straight to New Orleans to do some work on this project. Um, costumes are being made. This is, you know, um, what actually an enslaved person more would have worn in, in 1800, 1811 in that region. A lot of times people think, oh, they wore like burlap sacks, and it's like, that's actually not true. Um, and one of the ways which enslaved people's humanity gets taken from them is just like, oh yeah, they, they wore just whatever cast off the master hat. There's some truth to that, but actually this is a more accurate picture of the kind of thing enslaved people would have had. And this slave revolt, um, this, you know, this is making the costumes. The slave revolt is going to have, you know, men and women that are participant. In fact, this uh, a lot of the leaders of the rebellion were women. We know that, and so this reenactment is going to have a lot of women that are part of it. Um, there are shirts that are being made that are, are really pretty cool that uh, uphold this. Um, and there's, you know, before this happens, there's a cool book which I've got a couple copies of. There are like two here. If people want to buy them afterwards, they're like twenty-five bucks. Um, it's my research into slavery. It's not really about slavery by and reenactment, which is a project about freedom and emancipation, but to do that project, I need to think about slavery. So it's like an artist book about slavery. Um, and I'll show like two more images. This was actually made not in response to uh, the recent 
uh, shooting in Florida. And uh, this was made actually about six months ago. Um, but it uses a slogan which people uh, you know, think is important. And, and actually, the Never Again slogan comes out of uh, the Holocaust, actually. A lot of Jews said, look, we want to make sure that never again. We don't want this to happen again. And so I started a lot of the conversation today saying, hey, look, we need to make sure that sort of the politics that are going on in America don't become an entrenched fascism. That we're, I think we're kind of living in 1933 or 1934 in Germany. It's similar. And we want to make sure we don't get to 1941. Um, and so I made this work, which um, displays in museums, but it also is displayed on the street corners in New York and, and kiosks there. And I want to show this and then one more image, but I'm going to it's been a couple seconds talking about this. I think that in these times where we are confronted with fascism, and, and again, it's not just something that's a uniquely American phenomenon, but it is taking place here, where the president can see a march of, of white supremacists, open white supremacists that are you know, just straight up Nazis. It's like, you know, there's some good people there. Um, well, no, they're not. Um, and so I think it's really important that people resist, and I think it's really important that people defy fascist authority. And I think people need to be willing to break the law. The people who basically did some of the most critical stuff that happened in the civil rights movement were people who broke the law. They went on buses and integrated them. And not, not just the way that, that um, Rosa Parks is famous for doing, but the, the freedom riders that actually intentionally went and defied laws, not just policy, but defied law. Um, they actually were an important part of changing and actually breaking the back of Jim Crow. Um, People who hid my wife, well not my wife, but her family in Holland uh, during the Nazi occupation and kept them alive were breaking the law at tremendous personal risk. They could have also been sent to the camps for doing that. People who were participating in a slave revolt were breaking the law. People who um, helped enslaved people run away were breaking the law. Progressive social change happens from below, and a lot of times it happens when people are willing to break the law. There are people right now who are leaving water in the desert for people who are trying to cross the, the southern border to get to, to America. Those people are arguably breaking the law. There are laws that say what they're doing is illegal, whether courts determine that they're actually breaking the law, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. But I'm glad people are taking the humanitarian step of saying we're not gonna let people die in the desert if all they need is water. Um, so. We're in very heavy times, and I you know, think that if you're trying to change the world either through your art or through activism or in other ways, we actually have to, there's a, a place where our morality and our epistemology, our understanding of the world, where they meet. And you know, we don't all have the same options to defy fascist authority, and we don't have the, all that have the same ability to break the law in ways that can actually save people's lives or change the world radically. But if we aren't willing to make that step, then we actually won't be able to. So the last image of my work I'm going to show is this. Um, it's an artwork, and it's actually hard to see it the way this is projected. But you can see part of it. So it's just a world map. And Africa and Europe are kind of in the center. And there's text that say, imagine a world, which is pretty easy to see. And, and I, part of why I do this is I want people to actually do that do a thought experiment. To imagine a world they'd like to live in. I think there needs to be more romanticism right now in the world. And I don't mean it like just more love. I mean there needs to be more romantic dreaming of like, hey, let's really change the world. Let's dream big. And what you can't really see here is that it faintly says, without America. So do that thought experiment of imagining the world, but imagine it without America. Um, regardless of whether you view America as fundamentally a force for good or not, if you view America, like I do, is a, a tremendous problem and a disaster for humanity. Um, and, and I look forward to today when it's in the, the dustbin of history. It has disproportionate influence, and some of that influence is good. I've been to South Africa, and I've been to the slums of Kailicha, and seen um, wild style graffiti on the walls in South Africa, which came from the South Bronx. That's a good thing. I also know that there are drones that are flying over Pakistan right now that have American flags on them and they're killing people, including people in wedding parties and, and people that have nothing to do with you know, so-called terrorism. I know that America's economy I mean, is destroying the world. It's approach to science, the fact that in, in, you know, there are places in Africa where women otherwise might have access to abortion, but the US policy is preventing that from happening. 
Um, so imagine a world without America. Do that thought experiment. And you know, in this work, you could see that you know you get Florida, you get Maine, New York, uh, you get Alaska. Oregon kind of dropped off. No, it's not against Oregon. I'm not hating on Oregon. And, and you know, if you're from Canada, Canada doesn't exist. And, it, and you know, it's not about Canada. But you guys knew what you did by moving your country close to America. So. Um, <laughs> But it, you know, it really isn't about geography. It's actually about imagining the, the world without all the disproportionate influence that America has. And in showing this work, one of the things I, I will say is that um, I started off by, sh by sh this, this first real piece I really showed was uh, what is the proper way to display a US flag. During the controversy of that, when I was receiving death threats and when um, my school was receiving bomb threats and when I was trying to figure out how do I make work in the world and what do I do, um, I had, in college, I had become a revolutionary and become a communist. And, you know, schools should challenge your thinking. You should come out differently from a school than when you go in. And when I was 18, I thought, I'm rebelling against my parents. I don't like them. I don't think like them. But it really was only when I got to college that I started sort of really thinking for a little bit more for myself. And all of my friends and I were flipping around. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, first we were, you know, some of my friends were vegan. And then we were like atheist. And then we were anarchists. And then we were, you know, existentialists. And then we were communists. And then we were anti-communist. You know, it's like, you know, there's a lot of changing of ideas. But we were really searching for philosophy. And that's an important thing. And hopefully you guys are going through that process now, of figuring out who you are and, and how do you participate in the world. And so I become a communist. And I say that in part because, you know, it's like, I want you to understand more where my work is coming from, but also because one of the people that I sort of, through being a communist, discovered a couple of years before I made that work, and he had said something, written something, this guy named Bob Avakian, who's the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, that was really resonant at the time. It wasn't about my work. He said, but if you can conceive of a world without America, without everything America stands for and everything it does in the world, then you've already taken great strides and begun to get at least a glimpse of a whole new world. If you can envision a world without imperialism, exploitation, oppression, and the whole philosophy that rationalizes it, a world without division into classes or even different nations, and all the narrow-minded, selfish, outmoded ideas that uphold this, if you can envision all this, then you have the basis for proletarian internationalism. And once you've raised your sights to all this, how could you not feel compelled to take an active step Active, hold on, I've got my pages out of order. Take an active, um, that page got left. So basically an active step in realizing that dream. Um, so I say that because, you know, Avakian is not your daddy's communism. He's actually reimagined and re-envisioned communism to make it both viable and desirable for the 21st century. And so, you know, it helps you to understand my work, what's sort of the theoretical background of it, but if you want to change the world, you should really check out Avakian. You might not like everything he says, you might think, man, that Dred Scott guy's got an antenna growing out of his head, he's crazy, you didn't get the memo that communism was a disaster. I got the memo, but I think there's an answer to it. And, and so Avakian has a lot of that, and so if you want to change the world, you should get into what he says. So if you want to know more about my work, you can go to dredscott.net. If you want to know more about slave rebellion reenactment, you can go to slaverevolt.com. And if you want to know more about Avakian, you can go to revcom.us. And with that, I've done a lot of talking. I talk actually about 10 minutes longer than I planned. It's been about 70 minutes. But now you guys can ask me some questions or make some comments. Please don't throw tomatoes. But if, we, if you want to talk and have a good conversation, now's the time. And we can get the lights up so we can see the audience a little bit more. And, and yeah, let's talk. And I see that there's some microphones on either side, so if you want to ask a question, it would probably help the, this, the video that's being made to talk into the mic. There's no place on earth that right now I think is a society that I really want to live in that meets my ideals. I do think that in 
China between 1949 and 1976, during when Mao Zedong was alive, it was actually a really revolutionary society that had done things like doubling life expectancy, eradicating syphilis, eradicating opium addiction, um, teaching tremendous literacy, having far more press and publications of people, um, you know, being able to have access to newspapers, had got basic science and, and irrigation to parts of society, and most importantly, people were able to participate in the direction that the society went. A lot of the cultural revolution was really about what direction society was going to take, whether it was going to be the capitalist society that China is today, or whether it was going to continue to, to be a socialist society and, and actually help get humanity to a, a communist world. I think that was a society that was very vibrant and viable, um, even though it actually wasn't going to get to a communist world. There was some understanding that, that um, was actually sort of cutting against people really eliminating classes, including on how they understood reality and truth. And, and I could talk more about that, but I do think it was a very revolutionary society. And the Soviet Union from 1917 up through the early 50s, um, even though it had real shortcomings, including some that led to real horrors, was a, a very revolutionary society. I mean, it was the first country, the Soviet Union, that, that made a, abortion uh, legal and available on a wide scale um, in, I believe, 1921 or something like that, very early on. And there were many ways, including art and culture, that those were, it was a vibrant society um, that, you know, I mean, you know, even something as simple as like the Heineken beer logo, we wouldn't have that without the constructivist art movement that happened in, in the Soviet Union and the Soviet avant-garde. So there were a lot of ways in those societies that were very vibrant. At the same time, you know, it's like the point is not like let's move back to the Soviet Union in 1930 because again, that society was not going to get to a classless world either, um, and there were uh, you know real horrors that happened that we should not repeat. And and so I think that why I'm really interested in in Baba Beke and his writing is I mean the dude is really a communist. He's standing on the shoulders of what went before and he upholds those societies, but he also has some substantive criticism of that, drawing on a wider range of human experience. And the point is, you know, I was actually, I think, you know, actually on the plane over here, I was in a conversation with somebody who was actually fairly critical of America, but he, his, but he also was like, man, but like that Russia place is fucked up. And I think Russia right now is a pretty fucked up place. It's not like, you know, it's like, let's move to Russia. Um, but, and, and you know, he said Putin, that guy's a you know, real terrible dictator. And I think, yeah, that guy Putin really is a terrible dictator. And the one before him and the one before him, you know. So I'm not saying, hey, Russia, good. That's not what I'm saying. But if our spectrum of what politics we want is something that really sucks or something that kind of sucks, that's actually not where we should set our sight. The romanticism that I was talking about of Imagine a World Without America is challenging people to think outside of the framework that really constrains a lot of how we think of what our political future and economic future lies in. And I, you know, I think it is horrible that we live in a world where, you know, a nuclear war could be started by two kind of crazy guys, so they each can ex one can expand his empire and the other can actually survive. And we're living in a world where, you know, global climate change is threatening all species on Earth, and yet all leaders everywhere in the world are like, yeah, let's make some minor changes, if that. And leaders in this country are like, burn more coal. We got to burn more stuff, you know. Um, and so we can't set our limits on what is now. I mean, it, you know, it's like, yeah, Sweden's probably kind of a nice place to live, but if you look at its international relations, it's not so good. And that's not the limit of what's possible. I mean, I'm not looking for personal salvation. I'm looking for humanity getting to a sustainable, desirable place. And I think that, you know, that is sort of a re-envisioned re communism, but that's actually going to take a lot of work to get to. And no, I don't think it's the kingdom of heaven where sunshine and rainbows will fart out of my ass. That's not, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. There's going to be a lot of struggle, a lot of complexity, a lot of difficulty, and there will still always be, you know, nature is, is going to be a challenge for humans to, to sort of live in harmony with, and, and, and so it's not, you know, it's, it's not utopia, but I do think we could get to a society far better than anything that exists on Earth right now. World society? Well, ultimately, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, we get rid of all nations, then we wouldn't have to have wars. <laughs> um, if we looked at the world's resources as something like, oh, well, you're the people who live in that region of the world are facing more pressure from drought and deserts and stuff. Maybe we should work to make sure they have food. Um, and even if it means we have to work harder than they work to be able to enable to feed them, if there's enough capacity to grow food for everybody on the planet, that would be a good thing. And 
you know, about healthcare, the relative, you know, distorted economy where there's some, you know, uh, lopsided world where there's some rich, powerful countries that have actually, you know, relatively decent medical coverage here. It's really, really, really crazily expensive and bureaucratic, but nonetheless, you know, medical care for many, many people, not everybody, but for many people here is tolerable. And certainly in countries like, you know, England and, and you know, in France or Germany, it's pretty good. But in, you know, if you live in, in uh, Tibet, not so much. You know, you live in Haiti, it's not so good. But, you know, these, the history of these countries has brought us to a place where it is a very lopsided world, but we don't actually have to accept that. And, you know, I have a lot more in common with the people of the world than I do the current political leaders. And, and so I think we do want to ultimately get to a world without classes, without borders, and, and all of, you know, hopefully we'll have differing and interesting cultures still existing in other parts of the planet. But, but you know, let's get to like a world society that would be much better than this one. Yeah, I thought it was a real, the question was, did I see the movie Black Panther? And somebody earlier said Wakanda forever, and I'm like, I'm with that. Um, you know, so I, I think it's actually a really good movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's really, really powerful. It is a superhero movie. I mean, it's not like a prescription for how to get free now. And, and actually, the, the, the political programs advocated by the two main black leaders in the film Neither of them actually reflect my what I think is necessary. I mean, I think they're both fantasy and both have some real shortcoming. Um, but I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you know, the political platform put forward are, are really limiting. That said, the movie it's this you know it basically centered. I mean, it's one of the few movies I've seen where sorry, no disrespect to all the white people in the audience, but you ain't the center of the movie. Um, it's actually a movie that's centered around black people, and it actually has a complex, sort of fa fantastical African society, but it draws on, it's, you know, they're based on a lot of different African cultures, and it actually shows them in very beautiful, vibrant ways. It's utopic in, in some senses, but it really draws on sort of relative contemporary African culture to make a world where that looks like that's badass and that's what you want to be part of. And it has very important cultural critiques of colonialism and imperialism and running throughout the movie. And women play a pretty strong role. They're badass women leaders in the film. And so there's a lot, lot to it. I could talk more, but again, it'd be better to do it if we had all seen the film and I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen it because it really is a joyous film. It's really, really cool. You know, but it's a superhero movie. It's, but it, but it, it's a really cool superhero movie. And the, the film, I mean, I'm, as Carrie has pointed out, I'm old and decrepit. Um, so I, I remember when Star Wars first came out. It, I, I was 12 years old when the first Star Wars, the good Star Wars came out. And, and sorry y'all who were born recently and thought y'all Star Wars was decent. No, the, the, the first one, it was mind blowing because nobody had seen anything like that. And it was a movie that I saw twice in the the the, uh, 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 the Empire Strikes Back, Strikes Back. I also saw it twice. There are a few other movies I've seen a couple times, but rarely like at the same time within a couple months of a couple weeks of each other. And Black Panther is a film that I'm going to go see again. I've only seen it once so far, but it's it's really fun. And I mean, I saw. Some kid, I, I happened to go the opening night and I went to a, an early evening showing. And so schools had just let out and a lot of families had come with their kids, including kids that were like, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old. And after the movie, all these kids were like taking poses like the main character in Black Panther in front of the, in front of the movie's you know, signboards. They really wanted to be that superhero. And they really wanted to fight for sort of freedom of African people. And I bring up that story because there's a personal element to that. So I was a comic book nerd back, you know, when I was six or seven, I, I had friends, and you know, we liked to draw comic books. And one, my one of my, my friend Nolan, he actually could draw pretty well, and I not so much, but um, I made up for it in later life. But it, it's um, we we would sometimes we would trace the heroes. And I, you know, and, and one, one day we actually, you know, like a lot of kids have like a lemonade store, lemonade stand. 
We did that, but with superhero drawings. So for 25 cents, you could buy an original Dred Scott or Roland Walker. Um, you know, and of course, people pitied us and gave us money for these crappy drawings. But, but you know, I liked. I, I mean, I remember I liked. You know, Thor. I liked Silver Surfer. I liked. You know, uh, uh, the Thing. I liked. Uh, you know, a lot of superhero. You know, the Vision. And for those of you who weren't comic book nerds. These were all guys like man, had really kick-ass powers. I mean, Thor was a god. The Vision could do just about anything. He could dematerialize and rematerialize. Silver Surfer was this galactic dude who could fly on a surfboard across the universe and could do just about anything. These were like badass superheroes. And so, my mom at some point comes into you know, our room when we're drawing these superheroes and, and, and says, "Well, why don't you draw any black superheroes?" And I, quite matter of fact, I said, Mom, don't you know superheroes can't be black? And so, in thinking of that, and you know, I, I like those superheroes that I like, I had completely erased anybody that looked like me from the possibility of being a fantastical creature that had these amazing powers. And so, Black Panther actually has all these kids, including a lot of black kids, who can envision themselves being superheroes, saving the world, saving black culture, saving black people, and being black. And so I think that's actually kind of awesome. Um, so, yeah. So go see Black Panther if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, go see it again. And take some kids to go. So in, in thinking about the first piece you showed us, yeah. and the reaction to that, And then thinking about today and the kind of like social media echo chamber that we all live in where people just sort of listen to the people that are around them, they agree with them, or get on Facebook and argue with each other. It seems like we're in a, in a place where it would be difficult to incite that kind of a reaction from art. I, I just, I haven't seen anything that's gotten that kind of a, that's pissed off the president with sufficient <laughs> Um, well, so the question is, in a certain sense, it's like, can art, and specifically visual art, actually, in, in this place where people are just talking to themselves through social media, can art actually penetrate that and have uh, either piss people off or perhaps a dialogue or something? And I think that, you know, social media and the internet has changed some things, but you know, the, a man was lynched by police yesterday when that was shown at Jack Shaman Gallery. Fox News had the, the kindness to talk about it. And while most people really liked the artwork and the New York Times liked it, a lot of other people came to see it, they dug it, powerful, you know, influential curators were putting it on Instagram. Fox News was not exactly a fan of the work. And the people who watch Fox News, even if they hadn't seen the work, were kind enough to call up and threaten the people who worked at the gallery. Um, the gallery was a little bit concerned, and their landlord basically threatened to evict them. And the landlord was more concerned. I mean, the, the, the uh, gallery was more concerned. So they went, without my suggestion, to talk to the police to say, hey, look, you know, we've been receiving all these threats. We want to make sure that uh, you protect us. And, and the cops were like, well, you do you know we kind of don't like this work, and yeah, we'll show up, but we're you know kind of reluctantly doing that, um, and we can't. And the, the the sort of people on the desk who were the community affairs people were basically saying, look, the beat cops, you know, I can't be responsible for what they do if they see that. Um, so while it wasn't on the level of you know a president denouncing the work, there were some people who really liked the work and put it all over social media, and there were other people who really didn't like the work. Um, I think that there is work, various culture that kind of breaks through. I'm, actually, what is the proper way to display a US flag is extremely timely right now, and I would love for it to be shown. But anybody who's going to show that film has to know that they will, in all likelihood, really receive bomb threats and death threats, and they'll lose funding, potentially, and have to fight to get that funding replaced. People who've shown that work in the past, I mean, the museum in Alaska closed down because they showed that work. Um, a student, uh, sorry, a university gallery in New York 
on in, in, in a, about an hour and a half outside of New York City, showed the work, and the, the, the tires of the um, curator were slashed. Um, I think that some of the work I do and some work that other people do actually is breaking through in ways, but it's, it's difficult to show it because of the, the visceral and violent reaction that exists right now to people who challenge the status quo. I mean, you know, Colin Kaepernick and people in the NFL who are very beloved you know, people, but to, to a lot of people. I mean, you know, the President of the United States is denouncing them and, and saying they should leave the country and threatening them and calling on the, the NFL to basically, you know, disallow any player that, that, that you know, kneels during the national anthem from ever playing, ever working again. Um, you know, President Shithole has also uh, <laughs> said that Mineral Street you know, shouldn't be respected or acted. The, he's cr critiqued Hamilton, the Broadway musical, which is the most popular musical on Broadway at the time. He's gone after Saturday Night Live, which is the most popular late night comedy show on. Um, the, his administration has targeted Madonna, who, you know, is a very, very popular music musician. All these people who are not visual artists, but have been very much jacked up by very powerful forces. And so I think it, I think, Art and culture really matters in these times, and I think there's a real sort of culture war happening. But it's having different; um, it's playing differently than it, it did in 1989 through 1992, kind of when there was a different culture war. And I, I think that the stakes are kind of higher right now, and it will be interesting to see where it where it goes.